Part 3 The Power and the Glory 1541-1322 BC The Valley of the Kings, Luxor Temple, the Colossi of Memnon, and the Gold Mask of Tutankhamun, the dazzling cultural achievements of ancient Thebes conjure up a lost world of breathtaking opulence and artistic patronage on a lavish scale. Created in the space of eight generations, these towering monuments and dazzling treasures are the legacy of a single royal line, the 18th dynasty, that ruled over the Nile Valley for two centuries. Its period in power represents the high-water mark of pharaonic civilization, when Egypt's confidence and sense of its own destiny seemed to know no bounds. Casting off the yoke of foreign domination, King Amos and his descendants promulgated the cult of monarchy with a renewed vigor. If divine kingship was the drama, Thebes was the stage. With the wealth created by foreign trade and wars of conquest, this modest provincial town in Upper Egypt was transformed into the religious and royal capital of an empire, a hundred-gated city with obelisks, temples, and giant statues dominating the skyline in all directions. From its palaces and offices, courtiers and bureaucrats govern the king's realm with ruthless efficiency, controlling every aspect of people's lives and livelihoods. While the king played out the great ceremonies of state, his people continued to labor in the fields, their lot little changed. In the cloistered world of the 18th dynasty, the only revolutions involved the institution of kingship itself. Although their reigns marked abrupt departures from accustomed practice, neither the female King Hatshepsut nor the heretic Pharaoh Akhenaten was able to overturn centuries of accumulated tradition. Part 3 charts the rise and fall, the triumph and tragedy, of the 18th dynasty, from national renewal to decadence and decay. It describes how, with dynamic and determined leadership, and no small measure of self-belief, a band of Theban loyalists succeeded against all odds in expelling the hated Hyksos invaders and reunifying the Nile Valley. Shaking off the dishonor of foreign rule, Egypt extended its reach to emerge as a great imperial power, controlling a territory that stretched more than 2,000 miles. Breaking out of their former introspection, the pharaohs discovered a role for themselves on the world stage. Foreign emissaries from distant lands brought exotic tribute to the royal court, while the Egyptian army swept all before it in the hills and plains of the Near East. In the south, the systematic colonization and exploitation of Nubia gave Egypt mineral wealth to match its military might, and provided the royal workshops with the raw materials to manufacture sumptuous and sophisticated works of art. It was truly a golden age. Yet the steady enhancement of royal authority on top of so much power and prosperity proved disastrous. When a ruler with a penchant for radical theology decided to push the godlike status of the monarchy to its logical extreme, Egypt was turned upside down as hallowed cults and customs were swept away in an orgy of autocratic and puritanical fervor. Only the death of the heretic king and the swift maneuverings of counter-revolutionaries ensured a return to the old ways and a more stable regime. But in the process, the 18th dynasty itself withered and died, having been weakened and discredited. Its passing paved the way for a new imperial order, one based not upon fine gold but upon cold bronze. Chapter 10 Order Reimposed Armed Struggle The liberation of Egypt from Hyksos rule would be remembered by later generations as a moment of national renewal, of cultural renaissance, the dawn of a new age. The kings who led the fight for Egyptian independence would be regarded as founders and unifiers on a par with Menes, the first ruler of Egypt, and the great Menchuhotep, victor in the country's protracted civil war. Egyptologists, too, share this view of the struggle between the indigenous Egyptians and their Asiatic overlords. The expulsion of the Hyksos signals the beginning of the New Kingdom, that most glorious of eras in the long history of ancient Egypt. But that was not how it felt at the time. King Kamos's lament on the state of his country was heartfelt. In 1541, hemmed in between the Hyksos in the north and the Kushites in the south, Egypt as an autonomous territory occupied barely a third of the area that the great kings of the 12th dynasty had controlled. For many Egyptians, even within the Theban heartland, the status quo did not seem such a bad option. After all, collaboration with the Hyksos ruler in Hutware had its benefits, the Thebans were allowed to cultivate fields and to pasture herds and lands under Hyksos control, and receive supplies of animal fodder from the same region, in return for taxes paid to their foreign masters. Kamos's own officials are reported to have told him that they were happy with this relationship. While this may be a classic piece of royal propaganda, designed to portray the king as a resolute and decisive leader in the face of cowardly and complacent officials, it probably contains more than a grain of truth. The Hyksos had brought technological innovations to Egypt, not least the horse and chariot, opened up the country to Mediterranean commerce on a grand scale, and shown themselves every bit as adept at administration as the native Egyptians. A policy of peaceful coexistence would certainly have been the easy option. But it held little attraction for a man and a dynasty with ambitions to recapture the glories of the past. For a proud Theban, foreign occupation of any part of the beloved land was anathema, 
and Camos expressed his personal determination in the clearest possible terms. My wish, he told his closest lieutenants, is to rescue Egypt. One before Egypt could be said to have been rescued, however, there were the small matters of continued Hyksos occupation and a growing Kushite menace to deal with. The ruler of Kush had built up a formidable army with a sizable cavalry, and would lose no opportunity to extend his writ. The raids on Nekep a generation earlier had taught the Thebans a valuable lesson. Securing their southern frontier was an essential prerequisite to engaging the northern enemy. Outnumbered by the Hyksos forces and with inferior military technology, they could ill afford to fight on two fronts simultaneously. The threat from Kush would have to be neutralized first. So in 1540, in only his second year on the throne, and after months of preparation, Kamos led his forces southward. Their immediate mission was to retake Wawad and secure it against Kushite attack, thereby creating a buffer zone on the Theban's southern flank. Moving through the sparsely populated stretch of valley south of Abu, they seemed to have encountered little if any resistance. As they reached the foot of the second cataract, their goal loomed into view, the fortress of Buin. After serving as one of the main nerve centers of Egyptian military occupation throughout much of the Middle Kingdom, Buin had fallen easily under Kushite control in the following decades. The fort's Egyptian inhabitants had all too readily switched sides, serving their Nubian masters as dutifully as they had the great kings of the 12th dynasty. But once they saw a new Egyptian army massed in force on the horizon, they appear to have capitulated without a fight, rediscovering their erstwhile allegiance to the lord of the two lands. Welcomed as a conquering hero, Kamos oversaw the restoration of Buin's defenses and its rearmament as a vital forward garrison. Strategic commander that he was, his vision extended beyond immediate defensive needs. Looking to the future and the long-term occupation of Nubia, he also re-established Egyptian administration in the region. No king could rely on the vacillating loyalties of fortress commanders. A different mechanism would have to be found to ensure direct royal control of the conquered territories. Kamos's solution was an administrative innovation that would characterize Egyptian control of Nubia for centuries to come. He appointed a trusted official, Teddy, to be the first king's son of conquered Nubia, a viceroy who would act on the king's behalf and answer directly to his royal master for all Nubian affairs. With Teddy firmly installed in the viceregal headquarters at Pharos, Kamos and his forces returned to Egypt to prepare for battle with the Hyksos, an altogether more difficult and dangerous proposition. Kamos's strategy for his northern front was as much psychological as military. His calculation was that a policy of shock and awe directed against the Hyksos supporting towns of Middle Egypt would have a profound effect on his opponents' morale and soften them up for a final assault. In his own words, I sailed downstream as a victor to drive out the Asiatics according to the command of Amun, my brave army in front of me like a blast of fire. To his first target was the town of Nefresi, which lay inside Hyksos territory just to the north of the regional administrative center of Kamun, modern El Ashmanain. Nefresi was governed by an Egyptian called Teddy, son of Pepi. If Kamos's forces could make an example of him, other collaborators might heed the message and desert to the Egyptian side. After maneuvering into position under cover of darkness, the Theban army struck Nefresi at first light, I was upon him like a hawk. My army were like lions carrying off their prey. Three showing no mercy, Kamos watched while the town was ransacked, then ordered it to be razed to the ground. A similar fate was dealt the settlements of Hardy and Pershake a few days later. With towns throughout Middle Egypt lying in ruins, Hyksos hegemony in the region had been destroyed. Thebes was on the march. Then an unexpected stroke of luck delivered Kamos a further propaganda coup. Building on the Theban's long experience and mastery of desert routes, honed in the days of civil war, Kamos had regular surveillance missions patrolling the tracks through the western desert, keeping a discreet watch over comings and goings, and reporting on any unusual movements. For their part, the Hyksos also relied on desert routes for trade with the Kingdom of Kush. Thebes might have been subject territory, but sending shipments of Nubian gold by river through the heartland of the resistance was simply too risky, hence the road between Sako, modern Elks, in Middle Egypt and the Kushite capital at Kerma via the western desert oases was a busy highway, carrying trade caravans and diplomatic messengers between north and south. One such envoy had the misfortune of being intercepted by Kamos's patrol, just south of the oasis of Jijas, modern Bar Aya. We can imagine the Thebans' delight when they discovered that the messenger was carrying a letter from the Hyksos king to the new ruler of Kush. And the contents of the letter were nothing short of explosive, from the hand of the ruler of Hutware. Aalsara, the son of Ra-Apepi, greets the son of the ruler of Kush. Why do you ascend a ruler without letting me know? Have you noticed what Egypt has done against me? The ruler who is heir, Kamos, penetrates me territory even though I have not attacked him Ashesayu. He chooses these two land sign order to afflict them, my land and yours, and he has ravaged them. 
Come northward, do not flinch. Look, he is here in my grasp. There is no one who will stand up to you in Egypt. Look, I will not give him passage until you arrive. Then we shall divide up the towns off Egypt. For despite his peak at not being kept informed about the Cushite succession, Apepi was making an extraordinary offer to his Nubian ally, in return for military support, he would be willing to share Egypt, a classic case of divide and rule. The Theban's worst fears were well founded. If they did not act, and soon, Egypt risked utter annihilation. Kamos's response was immediate and intuitive. Instead of killing the unfortunate messenger, he sent him back to Hutware with a message of his own for Apepi. I will not leave you alone, I will not let you walk the earth without my bearing down upon you. 5. To drive the point home, the messenger was also instructed to tell Apepi about Kamos's recent attacks on towns in Middle Egypt. Not only were the Theban forces brave and determined, they were scoring victories in the Hyksos's backyard. Apepi had fatally betrayed his own weakness by requesting Kushite support. Suddenly, the prospect of a Theban attack on Hutwari itself seemed more plausible than ever. If Kamos's vivid personal account of the war is to be believed, he did indeed press home his advantage and attack the center of Hyksos rule. He boasted of reaching the outskirts of Hutware, drinking wine from Apepi's vineyards, cutting down his trees, raping his women, and plundering his storeships full of produce from the Near East, gold, lapis lazuli, silver, turquoise, bronze axes without number, moringa oil, incense, fat, honey, willow, boxwood. Six he claimed to have gotten within sight of the royal citadel itself, a building he contemptuously referred to as the House of Brave Words where the Hyksos women peeped out from the battlements, like baby mice inside their holes. Seven lining up his naval forces in attack formation, Kamos launched an all-out assault on the Hyksos stronghold, but without apparent success. He made a brave face of this failed attempt, returning to Thebes in triumph at the head of his army. In time-honored fashion, he ordered that his heroic exploits be recorded for posterity on a series of great stele set up in the temple of Amun at Ipizit. But Theban celebrations were short-lived, rudely curtailed by Kamos's premature death a few months later in 1539. The cause of his untimely demise is not known. For all his bravery and bluster, his was not a victor's burial. He was interred in a modest, ungilded coffin with two daggers by his side, his life's work unfinished. As if Kamos's death were not devastating enough for the Egyptians, their sense of loss, frustration, and anxiety must have been compounded by the vagaries of the royal succession. Just three years earlier, Kamos had very likely been chosen as king in place of the heir apparent because he was of an age to carry on the fight that had claimed Sikhnura's life. Now, with Kamos dead as well, the heir could not easily be passed over again, even though he was only a boy. As Thebes waited for the new king, Amos, to come of age, ten long years passed in military stalemate. With Buin in Egyptian hands, Kush was successfully held at bay. Apepi's demoralized forces were in no position to launch an attack, but without a leader, neither were the Thebans. All they could do was sit tight and make preparations. Victory at all costs after a decade of enforced inactivity, Egypt was champing at the bit when Amos reached adulthood in 1529 and took his place at the head of his army. At last, the final push could begin. The best account comes from a man who was not merely an eyewitness but an active participant in the battle for Hutware. Amos, son of Abana, as his loyalist name suggests, was one of the Theban king's most eager and devoted foot soldiers. His father before him had served in the Theban forces. Growing up in the town of Nekep, a staunch ally of Thebes, Amos, son of Abana, would have absorbed loyalty to the Theban cause with his mother's milk. Pursuing a military career, he first joined the marines on the ship Wild Bull. A few years later, he was transferred to another craft, the Northern, which formed part of King Amos's fleet for the initial siege of the Hyksos capital. While the Theban navy blockaded Hutware, preventing Hyksos forces from breaking out, the king led his army on a carefully planned advance through Middle Egypt toward the apex of the delta. Their first objective was both strategic and highly symbolic, the city of Memphis, traditional capital of Egypt since the foundation of the state. Next came an equally significant target, Ayanu, cult center of the sun god Ra. It, too, fell with apparent ease. The Thebans could now claim to be a national army, one with divine support from the Creator God. Back at Hutware, Amos, son of Abana, joined a new warship, the Risen in Memphis, named to celebrate the fall of the capital. Spurred on by their comrades' success, the Marines launched a daring assault on the main Nile channel that flowed past the Hyksos citadel, killing several enemy soldiers in the process. The war of attrition seemed to be going Thebes's way. Amos, son of Abana, was rewarded for his bravery with the Gold of Honor, Egypt's highest military decoration the first of seven such awards during his long and distinguished career. 
a second marine assault had to be broken off when the king summoned his forces to join a fierce fight south of Hutware. As Theban land forces drew nearer their final objective, they were beginning to meet stiffer resistance. The final piece in King Amos's strategy, before the all-out attack on Hutware could commence, was the capture of Charu, the border fortress that had proved such a vital element in homeland security during the 12th dynasty. Three months after taking Ayanu, and after a brief siege, Amos's army captured the fort. Theban forces were now in a position to intercept any Hyksus retreat from Hutware. Apepi and his followers were caught in a trap. With such a carefully planned series of moves brilliantly accomplished, the final outcome was never in doubt, Hutware was plundered. Ate this laconic comment from Amos, son of Abana, summed up the Theban victory. For most of Hutware's Asiatic inhabitants, death came quickly. For those who managed to escape the destruction of their city, Egyptian forces lay in wait at the border. A few Hyksos may have made it to the relative safety of Hyksos controlled territory in Palestine, but King Amos had plans for them, too. Determined that there should be no hiding place for Egypt's erstwhile oppressors, as he saw them, he led his army across the northern Sinai and laid siege to Sharuhan, modern Tel El Ijol, the main center of Hyksos political and commercial power in the Near East. For three years, Egyptian forces surrounded the city until it, too, surrendered. A loyal garrison was duly installed, as at Buin, to secure the surrounding territory for the Egyptian king. And, just to make sure, a backup force was stationed at nearby Gaza, which had been renamed the town the ruler seized, just to rub it in. Amos's victory was total. After a brief tour of coastal Palestine, during which he hacked up a few towns to intimidate the native inhabitants, the king returned in triumph to Egypt. The hated Asiatic had been driven out. National unity had been restored. Expelling the Hyksos and securing Egypt's northern frontier with a defensive buffer zone were a good start, but Amos knew that the country's future prosperity would depend on more than just security. It needed renewed access to gold, and that meant large-scale reconquest and reoccupation of Nubia, especially the gold-bearing region south of the Second Cataract. This became the major strategic objective for the latter part of Amos's reign. Buin was already safely in Egyptian hands and was a useful forward base for operations, but what Egypt needed, above all, was a fortified headquarters in the immediate vicinity of the gold mines. That meant outdoing the great conqueror Sinusret III and setting the border even farther south than Samna. Fortunately, the perfect geographical location presented itself. The island of Sot, modern Sai, lay midway between the second and third cataracts, right at the heart of the gold-producing region. One of the largest islands in the Nubian Nile, it was ideal for settlement and fortification. On his only Nubian campaign, Amos headed directly for Sot, occupied the island, and built a military headquarters, enclosed by a massive fortified wall 15 feet thick, reinforced with buttresses. The site was well chosen, atop a sandstone outcrop that overlooked the east branch of the Nile and a broad section of the east bank. A sandstone quarry was opened up on Sot to provide building material for the fortress and other royal installations in Lower Nubia. And finally, Amos had a statue of himself installed in the temple at Sot to act as a focus for patriotic fervor and to inspire the loyal defense of his new southern headquarters, just as Sinusret III had done at Samna. With Egyptian hegemony now firmly established from the coasts of the Near East to the Upper Nile, Amos boasted that his slaughter is in Upper Nubia, his war cry in the lands of Phoenicia. 9 Egypt was great once more, its people free from occupation and the threat of invasion. But not everyone shared in the mood of national euphoria. Freedom, people might have remembered, meant different things to different audiences. For the monarchy, the restoration of order meant a return to the methods of the past, with the king at the apex of society, supported and served by an uncomplaining populace. For the populace, Egypt's rebirth meant a return to autocratic government. Yet a few people were willing to risk their lives to oppose the Theban monarchy and its seemingly unstoppable rise to absolute power. No sooner had Amos planted the Egyptian flag on Sot Island and begun to sail northward to Egypt than a minor rebellion broke out, led by a Nubian insurgent. He seems to have taken the opportunity of the king's temporary absence to launch an attack, but it was woefully underprepared and doomed to failure. Amos summoned his forces, engaged the rebel, and seized him as a living captive. His hapless followers were taken prisoner, no doubt to be sent to work in the gold mines of Nubia. Then, inspired perhaps by such a brave but reckless show of defiance, a more serious insurgency flared up. This time it was led by an Egyptian named Titian, possibly a son or relative of the governor of Nefresi, who had been the object of Kamos's wrath a generation earlier. Titian's cause, opposition to Amos's rule, had attracted a large number of supporters, and these malcontents clearly posed a real threat to the government and its plans. The king's response was immediate and ruthless. 
His Majesty killed him, his gang was annihilated. Ten the dissidents, or freedom fighters, had had their chance and had squandered it. There would not be another open rebellion against the Egyptian monarchy for 500 years. Hand in hand with political challenges came natural disasters. To the north of Egypt, the Minoan civilization had recently been devastated by the volcanic eruption of Thera. The ash cloud had completely buried the Minoan colony of Akrotiri, while burning debris falling from the sky had destroyed crops and houses on Crete, 150 miles away. Weakened by the resulting famine and social instability, the Minoan world, which had dominated the Aegean for five centuries, suddenly looked vulnerable, a fact not lost on the small but ambitious city of Mycenae, on the Greek mainland. At around the same time, though probably unconnected with the Theron cataclysm, a meteorological calamity beset Egypt, a violent rainstorm swept the country, causing major damage to property, including the royal residence. Determined to rectify this show of divine displeasure as vigorously as he had put down Titian's rebellion, Amos ordered the restoration of flood-damaged buildings and the replacement of temple furniture, so that Egypt was restored to its former state. 11. Recording his pious actions for posterity, the king likened the damage caused by the tempest to the recent ravages of the Hyksos. The message was clear, whatever the source of chaos, Amos, the true king and upholder of creation, would impose order in its place. Family values borders secured, access to trade and gold re-established, internal opposition silenced, Amos's achievements might have been thought sufficient to restore the might and majesty of the Egyptian monarchy. But his vision for the country went beyond practical economics and politics to embrace ideology as well. Whether by learning or instinct, Amos and his advisors realized that ideas could be the most powerful force for national unity, if harnessed appropriately and well-tuned to the Egyptian psyche. The king's own experience had taught him the importance of a close-knit family, and the same was undoubtedly true out there in the towns and villages of Egypt. With the country, or its rulers, at least, enjoying peace and plenty once more, Amos set about making his own royal family the primary focus for religious devotion throughout the land. It was perhaps his greatest achievement, and one that was to define his entire dynasty. Personally, Amos had particular cause to give public recognition to key members of his family. Because he had acceded to the throne as a boy, the government had been run during his minority by his grandmother Tetishri and his mother, Ahotep. Indeed, Ahotep's impeccable royal credentials gave her unrivaled legitimacy to carry out such a role. She was, after all, a king's daughter, a king's sister, a king's great wife, and, by the end of her life, a king's mother as well. The peculiarly incestuous relationships favored by Amos's family meant that his mother and father were full brother and sister, both of them offspring of Tetishri. Amos in turn married his full sister, Amos Nefertari. The relationships and the frequency of the name Amos, for both men and women, must have made life in the royal court either fiendishly complicated or greatly simplified, whether keeping it in the family to such an extent was designed to distinguish the royals from ordinary mortals, by copying the brother-sister marriages of the gods, or was intended merely to shut out any potential rival claimants, the result was an exceptionally close group of relatives in which the female members played an unusually prominent role. Amos's genius was to turn this family business into a national cult. At Abju, ancient burial place of kings and thus a key site for the veneration of royal ancestors, Amos erected a pyramid temple for himself, decorated with scenes of his victory over the Hyksos, and a shrine for his grandmother Tetishri. At its center, a monumental stella recorded that His Majesty did this because his love for her was greater than anything, else. 12. We can detect here, perhaps, the enduring bond between a man and his grandmother who brought him up while his own mother was busy with affairs of state. For a hotep, Amos's thanks and praise were even greater. He had a great stella set up at I Pizzit in the Temple of Amun, which was fast becoming Egypt's national shrine. As well as listing the king's pious donations to the temple, mostly huge quantities of gold from the mines of Nubia, the inscription exhorted the people of Egypt, now and in the future, to remember Ahotep's considerable achievements. It is an extraordinary encomium for an exceptional woman. As well as recording Ahotep's role in governing the country, the verses more than hint at her involvement in putting down the rebellion of Titian and reimposing law and order throughout the land. It is no coincidence that Ahotep's grave goods from her grateful son included a necklace of golden flies, awarded for bravery in battle, the fly was an appropriate symbol of perseverance. She was evidently a force to be reckoned with, and would serve as a powerful role model for other ambitious royal women later in the dynasty. Ahotep's curious epithet, mistress of the shores of How Nebiot, is particularly tantalizing. Much later, in the Ptolemaic period, the phrase How Nebiot was used to refer to Greece, and it suggests a connection between the 18th dynasty Egyptian royal family and the Minoan civilization of Crete. It may be no coincidence that, in addition to the golden flies, 
Ahotep's burial equipment included two objects, a dagger and an axe, with characteristically Minoan decoration. Recent excavations at Hutware lend weight to the theory of a diplomatic alliance between Amos's family and the Minoans, the leading naval power in the eastern Mediterranean. The public rooms of the early New Kingdom Royal Palace, built on the ruins of the former Hyksos citadel, were decorated with frescoes in Minoan style. Scenes of acrobats, bull leaping, and bull wrestling have close parallels on the island of Thera and on Crete itself, at the Palace of Knossos. Most suggestive of all is a large griffin, a motif related to Minoan queenship. Its presence at Hutware raises the intriguing possibility of a dynastic marriage between the Egyptian and Minoan courts. It might have been the first time that Egypt sought the protection of a foreign power against third-party aggression, it would certainly not be the last. Having thus honored his grandmother and mother, Amos's policy of elevating royal women to the status of national icons now turned to his own generation and his sister-wife, Amos Nefertari. Her rise to prominence coincided with a natural moment of transition in the life of the royal family the death of the Queen Mother Ahotep and the birth of an heir apparent. With this new arrival ensuring the dynasty's future, Amos Nefertari thus became a king's mother as well as a king's daughter, king's sister, and king's great wife, the same collection of titles held by her late mother. But her brother-husband had another title planned for her, one that would give her not just status but considerable wealth and political influence as well. Amos Nefertari was to become God's wife of Amun the female counterpart to the high priest of Amun and hence effectively joint head of the Amun priesthood. The creation of this new office was part of a wider reorganization of religious administration under Amos, and it was a masterstroke. With a flourish, it achieved two goals, giving the dynasty control of a major political and economic institution, the Temple of Amun, with its vast wealth and extensive land holdings, and establishing a close theological link between the cult of Amun and the royal family. To confirm his intentions, Amos erected another monumental stella at Ipizit, recording the property and authority vested in Amos Nefertari as God's wife. For her part, she did not disappoint. For the rest of her life, she used the title God's wife above all others. Gilded monuments when King Amos died a few years later in 1514, still only in his thirties, Egypt stood transformed. In the space of a single reign, the country had shaken off the yoke of foreign occupation, confirmed itself as a new and rising power in the Near East, regained mastery of the Nubian gold mines, and quelled internal dissent. The monarchy had triumphantly re-established itself at the apex of Egyptian society, mastering the political scene and engineering a brilliant symbiosis with the dominant national cult. The foundations had been laid for the power and glory of the new kingdom. Now all that remained to be done was to build upon those foundations, to give concrete architectural expression to the mystery and majesty of kingship in a manner that would last for eternity. That would be the task for Amos's son and heir, Amenhotep I, 1514-1493. Or, rather, for the Queen Mother, since Amos's premature death left Egypt, once again, with an underage monarch. This time the country was at peace, and the court could turn its full attention to a building program the likes of which Egypt had not seen for centuries. Amos had already reopened the limestone quarries at Ainu, modern Tura, late in his reign, and had boasted that stone blocks were being hauled from the quarry face by oxen from the lands of Phoenicia. 14 Under the young Amenhotep I, extraction resumed at all the great quarries, Basra and Hatnub for alabaster, Gabel el Silsala for sandstone, and turquoise mining started up again in the Sinai for the first time since the reign of Amenemhat III, 250 years earlier. The length and breadth of Egypt echoed once more to the sounds of quarrymen, masons, and builders. It was as if the Pyramid Age had returned. Only the emphasis this time was on temples for the living, not tombs for the dead. For the second time in Egyptian history, the focus of royal building activity was the dynastic seat of Thebes. In the centuries since it had first risen to prominence, the settlement had expanded beyond the confines of the Middle Kingdom walls, but conditions were still cramped and squalid for most of the inhabitants. In the absence of planning regulations, districts grew up organically, masking the grid pattern of the earlier town. With agricultural production the city's first priority, building land was at a premium, and tangles of houses were crammed together in a dense maze of alleyways. Space, water, and shade were desirable commodities in ancient Egypt but extremely hard to come by in an urban setting. Families who could afford to do so built upward to gain extra room, escape the risk of flooding during a high Nile, and retreat from the accumulated rubbish and foul odors at street level. Only the wealthiest Thebans could afford to build out of town on the desert margin, where more plentiful land made possible the construction of luxurious villas with their own pleasure gardens. City dwellers had to make do with the occasional breeze coming through window gratings high up in the walls, painted reddish-brown to reduce the sun's glare. All in all, 
life in New Kingdom Thebes was crowded and noisy. For those living closest to the Temple of Amun, it was about to get noisier still. Under the 18th dynasty, the great temple at Ipizit, Egyptian for the most selective places, was the greatest beneficiary of royal largesse. It had been founded by the Theban 11th dynasty in the dark days of civil war, and had been honored by the Theban 12th dynasty. Now, with another dynasty from Thebes on the throne of Egypt, Ipizit was again the natural focus for royal projects. Although the surviving Middle Kingdom buildings were relatively small in scale, the purity of the architecture and quality of the relief carving evidently had a profound effect on Amenhotep's builders. Inspired, in particular, by the beautiful monuments of Cenus Red Eye, they set about creating copies for the new king's grand design. Their replica of Cenus Red's Jubilee Pavilion was correct down to the last detail, only the substitution of the name Amenhotep for that of Cenus Red distinguished the copy from the original. Directly in front of the 12th Dynasty Temple, a great courtyard took shape, dominated by a giant pylon gateway resembling the hieroglyph for Horizon, the place where the sun rose and set. Amenhotep I's Ipizit would be nothing less than the act of creation and microcosm. The courtyard walls were decorated with scenes of the king offering to Amun, and priests offering to the king, the quintessential combination of divine and royal cults in a single space. In the center of the court, a magnificent alabaster shrine was erected as a resting place for the sacred bark shrine of Amun when it was carried in procession through the temple. The alabaster shrine's decorations stressed the mystic union between God and King, and depicted the royal jubilee, already being planned, though never actually celebrated. Along two sides of the court, small side chapels housed statues dedicated to the royal cult, their walls decorated with scenes of perpetual offerings. To complete the layout, a sacred abattoir was built next to the temple. It would be used to provide cattle for religious festivals and, of course, for the cults of Amenhotep I and his mother, Amos Nefertari. Ostensibly a magnificent new house for the god Amun, Amenhotep's constructions at Ipizit were equally a monument to divine kingship. The fact that the two strands could not be disentangled was entirely deliberate. By placing himself as the direct heir to the great royal builders of the Middle Kingdom, Amenhotep was consciously casting a veil over the intervening chaos. His work at Ipizit seemed to confirm that the sacred essence of kingship had passed directly from the 12th dynasty to the family of Amos. Like all great Egyptian rulers, Amenhotep I had a penchant for rewriting history. The king's ambition, to turn Thebes into a giant open-air temple to kingship, did not stop at Ipizit. In the sacred theater of the Nile Valley, the West Bank was just as important as the East, since the two together formed one of those symbolic dualities through which the Egyptians made sense of the world around them. In the particular case of Thebes, the West Bank was the city's main burial ground, where the rulers of the 17th dynasty had built their modest pyramid tombs, but it also had a deep and ancient connection with kingship. The dramatic embayment in the cliffs at Deir el-Bari was believed to be a dwelling place of Hathor, mother goddess and protector of monarchs. For this reason, the civil war victor, King Menchuhotep, had chosen it as the location for his mortuary temple and for the national war grave. The symbolism of the place must have been particularly striking for Amenhotep I not only had his own Theban dynasty recently emerged triumphant from another war, but the theological relationship between Hathor and the king provided the divine pattern for his own close association with his mother, Amos Nefertari. Their joint rule was not just God-given, it was divinely inspired. To give these ideas concrete expression, Amenhotep commissioned two chapels at Deir el-Bari, one of them directly in front of Menchuhotep's temple. He also built a sanctuary to house the bark of a moon when it traveled across the Nile from Ipizit in a great procession once a year called the Beautiful Festival of the Valley. At Deir el-Bari, as at Ipizit itself, the inscriptions and decoration emphasize the royal cult, with particular emphasis placed on the role of Amos Nefertari and on the king's much-anticipated jubilee. Finally, Amenhotep erected a temple dedicated to himself and his mother on the plain of western Thebes, directly in front of the 17th dynasty royal necropolis where his father and grandmother lay buried. They would have been proud of him. The cult of the royal family was now at the center of the nation's religious life, at Thebes and Abju, and the family's monuments marked the horizon in every direction. Long after their monuments had been dismantled and reused by later generations of rulers, Amenhotep I and Amos Nefertari were remembered and revered by the inhabitants of western Thebes as patron deities of the district. Their memory was especially sacred to one small community known as the Place of Truth, modern Deir el Medina. The community's foundation sums up the religious and architectural program of Amos's dynasty and its lasting impact on ancient Egyptian civilization as a whole. By the time Amenhotep I came to the throne, kings had learned from bitter experience that a monumental tomb, especially a pyramid, was more of a curse than a blessing. 
Advertising the location of the royal burial for all to see merely attracted the attention of tomb robbers and almost guaranteed that the deceased would not remain undisturbed for eternity. If the king were to enjoy a blessed afterlife, as intended, the nature of the royal tomb itself had to change. As part of his wider program of religious remodeling, Amenhotep I implemented just such a radical redesign. From now on, the royal mortuary complex would be split into two distinct elements. A mortuary temple, sited prominently on the plain, would stand as the monarch's permanent memorial and would act as a public focus for the royal cult. Quite separate, hidden away in the cliffs of western Thebes, a royal tomb cut deep into the rock would provide a secure resting place for eternity, without any outward sign to attract unwanted attention. To ensure complete secrecy for the royal burial, it would be necessary not only to conceal the tomb but also to isolate its builders from the rest of the population. The solution was to establish a workman's village, hidden away in a remote valley in the Theban hills, where those employed on the royal tomb, together with their wives and children, could live in splendid isolation. The secrets of their sensitive work would remain safe. The place of truth was duly founded, with Amenhotep I and Amos Nefertari as its royal patrons, and the community remained in use, fulfilling its original purpose, for five centuries. Today it is the single most important source of evidence for daily life in the new kingdom. As for Amenhotep I's own tomb, its whereabouts remain a mystery, despite more than a century of archaeological investigation. In contrast to his successor's sepulchres, which have become modern tourist traps, Amenhotep's dwelling place for eternity lies undisturbed. In this, as in the rest of his program for the Egyptian monarchy, his wish was fulfilled. Chapter 11 Pushing the Boundaries Firestorm over Nubia A paradox lay at the heart of Egypt's new kingdom renaissance. The country's restoration to its former glory had been led by the institution of hereditary monarchy, yet this very system suffered from fundamental weaknesses. For two successive generations, the throne had passed to minors. Although this gave the female members of the royal family an unprecedented opportunity to exercise leadership, having the sacred office of kingship held by a child, dependent on others for direction, was not exactly in accordance with the Egyptian ideal, nor was it a recipe for strong government. Worse still, the inbreeding favored by the Theban rulers of the late 17th and early 18th dynasties had narrowed the gene pool to a dangerous degree. Amenhotep I and his sister wife were themselves the offspring of a brother-sister marriage, as were their parents. With only two great-grandparents between them, it is perhaps not surprising that Amenhotep I and his queen were unable to have children. Indeed, it is remarkable that they were not afflicted by more serious congenital conditions. Monarchy is nothing without an assured succession, and the lack of an heir risked undoing all the hard-won achievements of Amenhotep and his dynasty. What the king lacked in fertility he more than made up for in strategic ability. Recognizing the imperative of a legitimate successor, he took the unusual decision late in his reign to adopt one of his most trusted and talented lieutenants, a man named Thutmosa, as heir apparent. Thutmosa's origins are shrouded in obscurity, the new king hardly wished to publicize his unorthodox path to power, but his selection was inspired. Though already in middle age, and unlikely to enjoy a long reign, he possessed apparently inexhaustible energy and determination. He had a bold vision for Egypt's destiny, one that involved not merely cementing the victories of Kamos and Amos but actively extending the nation's borders to forge an Egyptian empire. Under the Thutmoside dynasty, Egypt would be transformed, at home and abroad, into the most powerful and glittering civilization of the ancient world. Thutmosa I, 1493-1481, was the first king for three generations to come to the throne as an adult. He was in a position to begin his program of government straightaway, but only after he had countered any possible rumblings against his claim to the kingship. The continued presence of the royal matriarch, Amos Nefertari, gave his reign a much-needed stamp of legitimacy, but Thutmose decided to take more public steps to underline his right to rule. His first act as king was to issue a decree announcing his coronation and his formal adoption of royal titles, two ceremonies that confirmed a king in power and conferred upon him divine authority. He sent the decree to his viceroy in Nubia, Turi, with express instructions to erect monumental copies in the major centers of Egyptian control, Aswan, Kuban, and Wadi Halfa. The memory of rebellion against King Amos was still raw, and Thutmose was determined to browbeat his Nubian subjects into submission from the very start. For the land south of the first cataract, Thutmose's coronation decree was both a warning and a promise. Within twelve months, Nubia would reel from the most concerted and devastating campaign of conquest ever. Launched by Egypt. Enraged like a panther, Thutmose declared his aim to destroy unrest throughout the foreign lands, to subdue the rebels of the desert. Region. Won the firestorm over Nubia raged for most of his second year. On the throne, 1492. 
the rulers of the Middle Kingdom had been content to pursue a defensive strategy, guarding Egyptian interests in Wawat against the threat from the Kingdom of Kush through a mixture of economic engagement and political appeasement. The disastrous results of this policy had been visited upon Egypt when the country was at its weakest. Thutmose I was not about to repeat the same mistake. For him, the only long-term guarantee of Egyptian security was the annihilation of the Kushite threat. From the forward base on Sot Island, Thutmose ordered a flotilla of ships to be dragged over land around the dangerous rapids of the Third Cataract, ready for an all-out assault on Kerma, capital of the Kushite Kingdom. The onslaught that followed was unyielding and terrifying in its ferocity. Kerma was sacked and burned, its temple desecrated. The victorious Thutmose set out cross-country with a detachment of his army and a large entourage of officials. Rather than Following the river, they took instead the desert route from Kerma to the distant reaches of the Nile beyond the fourth cataract. This had both a practical logic and a symbolic purpose. It achieved the objective of extending Egyptian authority farther than ever before without the need to conquer all the intervening Kushite-controlled territory along the river. The king and his followers halted at a great quartz rock, modern Hagar el Merwa, near Kyrgyz, that rose up from the desert plain next to the Nile. A prominent marker in the landscape, visible for miles. Around, it was also of great spiritual significance to the local population. And was covered in religious carvings. Thutmose ordered a victory. Inscription to be carved over these native scribblings, obliterating them. With a bald statement of pharaonic power that proclaimed the boundaries of his new empire. The inscription also recorded the presence, at this most symbolically charged of occasions, of Thutmose's daughter Hatshepsut. For Thutmose, extending the boundaries of Egypt was not just a personal priority but the destiny of his new dynasty. It was an injunction the impressionable young princess would not forget. Returning to Kerma, the king looked upon the devastation that his army had wrought and, true to form, resolved to memorialize the crushing victory in yet another monumental inscription. The power of the written word to render permanent a desired state of affairs lay at the heart of Egyptian belief and practice, carved into the side of an imposing, sloping rock just outside the city limits, near modern Tombos, the text gives an extensive commentary on the Nubian campaign. Its blood-curdling tone surpasses even the ancient Egyptians' accustomed rhetoric, painting a lurid picture of the carnage visited upon the unfortunate inhabitants of Kerma. In the same breath, the inscription extols, righteous, warfare and pumps up Thutmose I as a glory-seeking conqueror who is ready to roam the earth, taking on all comers, he trod, the earths, and in might, and victory seeking a fight, but he found no one who would stand up to him. 3. The Tombos text, which describes foreigners as gods. Abomination, strikes a particularly uncompromising tone of exultant cruelty and rampant militarism. Before leaving Nubia, the king ordered a series of fortified towns to be established throughout the conquered territories, to give the Egyptians a permanent foothold in Kush and to deter future rebellions. One of these forts was called, with typical bombast, no one dares confront him among all the nine bows, the traditional enemies of Egypt. To facilitate Nubia's administration, it was divided into five districts, each controlled by a governor sworn in fealty to the Egyptian. King. In a further measure intended to inculcate loyalty, the sons of Nubian chiefs were forcibly taken to Egypt, to be educated at court. Alongside their masters, in the hope that they would learn Egyptian customs and an Egyptian worldview. They also served as convenient hostages against possible insurrection by their relatives back home in Nubia. An altogether more gruesome deportation awaited the defeated ruler of Kerma. If the Egyptian sources are to be believed, he was felled in battle by Thutmose I himself. If so, it was a mercifully quick death. On the Egyptians' triumphant journey home, the enemy's corpse was strung up at the bow of Thutmose's flagship, Falcon. There it hung, putrefying and flyblown, a gruesome mascot of the king's victory. And a dire warning to any other would-be foes. Once back in Egypt, the Conqueror thanked the gods for his victory by dedicating a stele at the sacred site of Abju. 
At the end of the usual pious formulae, the king reverted to type, reveling in his subjugation of foreign peoples, I made Egypt the chief, and the whole earth her servants. 4. Thutmose's empire building had now taken on a religious zeal. Wider still and wider. Conquering Nubia, a natural extension of the Egyptian Nile Valley and a land easily accessible by boat, was one thing. Extending Egypt's boundaries into Asia, with its multitude of city-states and unfamiliar terrain, was quite another. Yet no sooner had Thutmose finished celebrating bringing Kush to heel than he was busying himself with plans for an equally ambitious foray into the Near East, to wash his heart, that is, slake his desire, throughout the foreign lands. Five this time. However, the king's main aim seems to have been a short-term propaganda coup rather than all-out military supremacy. The Egyptian garrisons at Sharuhan and Gaza, established by his predecessors, seemed sufficient to prevent another Hyksos-style invasion by hostile Asiatics. Egyptian economic interests continued to be centered on the entrepot of Kabni, from which the royal court could obtain all the exotica it desired, timber, aromatic oils, tin, and silver. But this was not enough for Thutmose, scourge of Nubia. He craved international recognition for Egypt as a great power, on a par with the other emergent empires of the Near East. And he knew that the quickest way to win such status was a massive show of force right under the noses of his rivals. There may also have been a longer-term strategic motive for an armed foray into Asia. Thutmose's predecessors of the late middle kingdom had failed to recognize the threat posed by the Hyksos until it was too late. He was determined not to repeat their mistake. His envoys and spies would have told him that in northern Mesopotamia, far beyond the borders of Egypt, another potentially hostile power was growing in strength. The kingdom of Mitanni had been forged from a collection of smaller states by a force of Indo-European speaking warriors, as well as their strange tongue, reflected in the names of their kings, and some of their gods, they had brought with them from the steppes of Central Asia the horse-drawn chariot and a class of elite charioteers called the Marianu. With this highly effective new weaponry, Mitanni had grown strong enough in the time of Amos to invade Anatolia and inflict a heavy defeat on the Hittite kingdom. By the reign of Amenhotep I, Mitanni had driven the Hittites out of northern Syria, upsetting the delicate political balance in the Near East. Mitanni was on the march, sweeping all before it. It seemed only a matter of time before it encroached upon the Egyptian sphere of interest. Faced with such a prospect, Thutmose determined that a preemptive strike was the wisest policy, better safe than sorry. So, in the fourth year of his reign, he set out for the kingdom of Mitanni, known by the Egyptians as Naharan, the two rivers and other words, Mesopotamia. Details of the expedition are sketchy, but it seems likely that to avoid a lengthy and protracted campaign through Palestine, Thutmose opted instead for an amphibious operation sailing up the coast of the eastern Mediterranean and landing his forces in the friendly harbour of Kabni. From there, it would have been a much shorter overland march into northern Syria and to the banks of the upper Euphrates. Beyond the mighty river lay Mitanni proper. Local intelligence sources confirmed Thutmose's worst fears. Mitanni was indeed planning an attack on Syria-Palestine, directly threatening Egypt's economic interests. The king lost no time in engaging the enemy and made great carnage among them, 6. Capturing some of their prized horses and chariots. To rub salt into Mitanni's wounds, Thutmose did what might, by now, have been expected of him, he had a great commemorative inscription carved on the banks of the Euphrates, to mark the ultima thule of his new empire. From the borders of Mesopotamia, in the north, to the fourth cataract. In the south, Egypt's power had never been so widely felt. Honor satisfied, the Egyptian army turned for home. All-out conquest of Mitanni had never been in the cards, for Egypt had no strategic interest in controlling a land so far from home. But Thutmose had succeeded in firing a warning shot across Mitanni's bows and neutralizing its immediate threat. He had also demonstrated Egypt's new superpower status on the world stage, both to Mitanni and to its nervous neighbors. Yet rather than heading straight back to Egypt with 
his victorious forces, Thutmose decided to indulge in a classic display of triumphalist hauteur, halting his homeward march in the land of Nye. In the valley of the river Iranis, modern Asi, he proceeded to hunt the herds of Syrian elephants that roamed the area. This extraordinary act was no doubt carefully calculated. On a symbolic level, it drew on the ancient ideology of kingship, establishing an explicit parallel between the defeat of Egypt's enemies and the subjugation of untamed nature. Thutmose the military leader was consciously promoting himself as Thutmose the cosmic avenger. On a more practical level, it must have reinforced the news that by now was spreading throughout the Near East, that a great king had arisen in Egypt who showed as much machismo in his peacetime pursuits as he did on the battlefield. Her father's daughter. When Thutmose I died in 1481 after a reign of just a dozen years, he left as his legacy an Egyptian empire whose boundaries stretched from Syria to sub-Saharan Africa. The great kings of the Near East, the rulers of Babylonia, Assyria, Mitanni, and the Hittites, recognized their Egyptian brother as a full member of their select club. Yet this newly one authority was both superficial and vulnerable. At Kerma the local people had rebuilt their town and temple, reaffirming their indigenous traditions in defiance of their Egyptian overlords. As soon as news of Thutmose's death reached Upper Nubia, the Kushites revolted, hoping to regain some of the autonomy that their nemesis had so barbarously crushed. Foremost among the rebels were the surviving sons of every king of Kush whom Thutmose had slain and so gruesomely hung from the prow of his flagship. Revenge was sweet indeed. The Kushite forces attacked the fortresses built by Thutmose, killed their Egyptian garrisons, plundered their cattle, and for a time seemed to threaten Egyptian rule over Nubia. But they had reckoned without the Determination of Thutmose's young successor and namesake, who showed himself every inch his father's son, ordering an immediate military response to the uprising, Thutmose II, 1481-1479 commanded that every Nubian male should be put to the sword, save just one of the Kushite princes who would be brought back to Egypt for education in time-honored fashion. In his ruthless determination to defend his father's achievements, Thutmose II was no doubt supported by his half-sister and consort. Hatshepsut. Living up to her name, which means foremost of. Noble women, Hatshepsut was not merely the king's great wife. As. Daughter of Thutmose I by his chief consort, Hatshepsut clearly. Regarded herself as having a stronger claim to the throne than her. Husband, whose mother had merely been a secondary wife. So, when. Hatshepsut's young husband succumbed to ill health after only three years on the throne, she seized her chance. No longer content to stand on the sidelines, she set her sights firmly on gaining the top job. As for almost before her, kingship would be the focus of her ambition. Thebes her stage. Just as her father had extended the borders of Egypt, so Hatshepsut would push the boundaries of royal ideology further than ever before. For a woman to hold the reins of power in ancient Egypt was not unprecedented. At the end of the 12th dynasty, a female king, Sobaneferu, had briefly occupied the throne. More recently, during the upheavals and reconstruction of the late 17th and early 18th dynasties, three successive generations of royal women, Tetishiri, Ahotep, and Amos Nefertari, had exercised great influence over the affairs of state. On the face of it, Hatshepsut was merely following in this tradition when she ruled as regent for Thutmose. Two's infant son, her stepson, Thutmose III. As a contemporary inscription makes clear, there was a different tone to Hatshepsut's authority from the very start. After her husband's death, her position as God's wife gave her some authority, especially in the Theban region, but Hatshepsut and her courtiers must have been acutely aware that she was not the king's mother merely his stepmother and aunt. For her to exercise full control of the government would require appropriate ideological cover and proper theological justification. Her first bold step was to adopt the equivalent of a royal throne name, which she used alongside her queenly titles. Then, seven years into the new regency, in 1473, Hatshepsut made the determined 
and irrevocable decision to adopt the full panoply of kingship, the regalia of crowns and scepters and the hallowed titles and styles of Egyptian monarchy, although she had to share the throne with her young stepson, there was no doubting who was the senior co-regent. Hatshepsut's reign had begun in earnest. In the wake of such an unorthodox accession, the new female king and her advisers embarked on a concerted program of myth-making. To bolster her legitimacy, they promoted the story of her divine birth, and rewrote history to have her elected as heir apparent during her father's lifetime. On monuments and inscriptions, she consciously emphasized her father's achievements, calling herself the king's firstborn daughter, and studiously ignored the brief reign of her late husband. It was as if Thutmose II had never existed and the throne had passed directly from Thutmose I to Hatshepsut. This sleight of hand may have convinced some of her detractors, but there was still the awkward question of her gender. The ideology of kingship required, demanded, a male ruler. Yet Hatshepsut, as her very name announced, was female. Her response to this conundrum was deeply schizophrenic. On some monuments, especially those dating from the time before her accession, she had the images recarved to show her as a man. On others, she had female epithets applied to male monarchs of the past, in an apparent attempt to feminize her ancestors. Even when portrayed as a man, Hatshepsut often used grammatically feminine epithets, describing herself as the daughter, rather than son, of Ra, or the lady, rather than lord, of the two lands. The tension between male office and female office holder was never satisfactorily resolved. Little wonder that Hatshepsut's advisors came up with a new circumlocution for the monarch. From now on, the term for the palace, per AA, literally great house, was applied also to its chief inhabitant. Para, pharaoh, now became the unique designation of the Egyptian ruler. While Thutmose I had concentrated his efforts on building an empire, his daughter's greatest desire was to deck Egypt with buildings befitting its new status. Hatshepsut's reign is remarkable for the sheer number and audacity of her monuments, from a rock-cut shrine deep in the mountains of Sinai to a stone-built temple inside the fortress of Buin, in Nubia. But it was Thebes that benefited most from her plans. The city's sacred landscape, laid out at the very beginning of the new kingdom, offered Hatshepsut unrivaled opportunities to associate herself ever more closely with the state god Amun Ra, and Hence to silence her critics and doubters once and for all. For generations, Amun Ra's chief temple at Ipizit had enjoyed a theological importance belied by its rather modest proportions. Hatshepsut changed all that. She set about transforming it into a true national shrine, adding a noble pillared hall eight between her father's two monumental gateways. At the core of the temple she reshaped the Middle Kingdom sanctuary, while on the south side her architects created a vast new gateway, the largest to date, fronted by six colossal statues of the female king. Nearby, she erected a chapel carved from blocks of red sandstone and black granite, each of them decorated with exquisite scenes of Hatshepsut performing the rituals and duties of kingship. On the north side of the temple, she built a royal residence. With the revealing name the royal palace I am not far from him, that is, Amun Ra. The crowning glory of her additions to Ipizit were three pairs of obelisks, designed, quite literally, to point the way to the divine. On the base of one pair, she had her masons carve a long text, to record her pious motives for all eternity. It stands to this day as Hatshepsut's principal apologia, the most revealing insight into her character and ambition. Holy of Holies. Beyond Ipizit, Hatshepsut took up where Amenhotep I had left off, adding yet more architectural props to the great Theban stage set of kingship. From her gateway on the south side of Ipizit, she set forth a new axis that linked the temple of Amun Ra with a temple dedicated to the god's consort Mut and, beyond that, with a new shrine for the divine bark at Amun's southern sanctuary, modern Luxor. To make proper symbolic use of this new processional way, Hatshepsut's theologians inaugurated an annual celebration, the Festival of Opet, during which the cult image of a moon was carried from Ipizit to Luxor, for a period 
of rest and relaxation. A moon of Opet would journey across the river too. Visit the West Bank, and a small temple specially built by Hatshepsut too. Receive him, opening up yet another ritual axis. With the beautiful festival of the valley already connecting Ipizit and Deir el Bari. Processional routes now demarcated the whole of Thebes. The city. And everything in it belonged incontrovertibly to Amun Ra, thanks to the ministrations of his beloved daughter. Of Hatshepsut's many constructions in Egypt, none received more care and attention than her temple at Deir el Bari. The site's close. Assication with Hathor, mother goddess and guardian of kingship. Must have given it a special appeal to a female monarch. The fact that it lay directly opposite her new southern gateway at Ipizit it gave it added symbolic potency. Such a spot demanded a monument of uncommon quality. What Hatshepsut and her architects created at Deir El Bari over the course of 13 years remains one of the most remarkable buildings from ancient Egypt. The uniqueness of its design is striking, even today. Its scale and grandeur overwhelm just as their patron intended. Though devised, first and foremost, as a grand resting place for the bark shrine of Amun Ra during the beautiful festival of the valley, the temple called by Hatshepsut Jisur Jisuru. Holy of Holies, also incorporated shrines to Anubis, Hathor, and Ra, as well as a set of chapels for the perpetual celebration of her funerary cult alongside that of her father, Thutmosa I. A single building sought to incorporate every aspect of royal ideology, from the monarchs. Relationship with the ancient deities Hathor and Ra to the celebration of the royal ancestors and the king's eternal destiny. The entire complex was arranged as a series of huge terraces, with the sheer cliff face as a stunning natural backdrop. It was inspired by the neighboring temple of Menchuhotep, yet it outdid its predecessor in every department and cast Hatshepsut as the founder of a new age. A Causeway linked the main temple to a valley temple more than half a mile to the east. The last 500 yards of this processional route were flanked by more than a hundred sphinxes of Hatshepsut. The temple proper was likewise furnished with magnificent statuary, showing the monarch in different guises, offering to the gods or transfigured as Osiris. Behind the pillared facades of each terrace, delicately carved and painted scenes recorded key episodes from Hatshepsut's life, real or imagined, her divine birth, her election as heir, a parent, her coronation, the transport of her obelisks to Ipizit, and, perhaps most famous, the expedition she sent in 1463 to the fabled land of Punt to bring back exotic materials for Amun Ra. The vivid details of the African landscape, the Puntite stilt houses, and their obese queen have made this tableau one of the best known in any Egyptian temple. It seems to capture the freshness, vitality, and innovation that characterize the reign of Hatshepsut, the most effective and powerful of the handful of women ever to rule ancient Egypt. There is one further, unusual aspect to Hatshepsut's reign, the unprecedented favors bestowed on her most devoted follower. Senenmut. A man of humble origins, Senenmut rose to prominence. During Hatshepsut's regency, as tutor to her daughter, he enjoyed privileged access to the royal family's inner sanctum. As overseer of the audience chamber, he effectively controlled who did and did not get to see the regent. While as steward of the queen's estate, he wielded considerable economic influence. The combination of offices made him Hatshepsut's most influential courtier by far. He seems to have had an artistic bent, to judge from the unparalleled quantity, quality, and diversity of his surviving statuary, and his skills were recognized by Hatshepsut, who promoted him to the office of overseer of all the king's works, and chief architect. In this capacity, he masterminded the sculpting and transport of the Ipizit obelisks, and the construction of Holy of Holies. His special reward, among many, was royal permission to carve his own devotional reliefs at Deir el Bari, Ipizit, and in all the temples of Upper and Lower Egypt. Ten at Deir el Bari, he even had himself depicted in the upper sanctuary, albeit carefully concealed behind the open doors of the shrine. For a commoner to be shown in the most sacred part of the temple was not just unusual but unprecedented. He was likewise allowed to commission a vast funerary complex, the 
largest of its time, comprising a public cult chapel and a secluded burial chamber, the latter reaching right underneath the sacred enclosure at Deir el Bari and equipped with a stone sarcophagus. Another royal prerogative. It is little wonder that Senenmut's jealous. Contemporaries harbored suspicions about the precise nature of his relationship with Hatshepsut, and little wonder that a cheeky Theban workman illustrated the more scurrilous rumors in a sexually explicit graffito. Ironically, Hatshepsut's elevation to the kingship did not bring commensurate promotion for Senenmut. He was replaced as tutor too. The princess and subsequently disappeared from the official record. Whether he fell out of favor, retired, or simply died from natural causes remains a mystery. What is clear is that he never married and he left. No heirs. Such, perhaps, was the price of winning and keeping his mistress's favor. Mightier yet. While Hatshepsut, in her more ambitious moments, may have hoped to see her daughter follow in her footsteps, a mother-daughter succession would have stretched the ideology of kingship just too far. In the end, the throne passed to her stepson, nephew, and son-in-law, Thutmosa. Three, who after a decade and a half as junior co-regent finally achieved sole rule in 1458. Whatever his personal feelings toward his stepmother, he certainly shared her idolization of Thutmosa I in it. Was with his grandfather's energy and zeal that he set about consolidating his imperial inheritance. Just ten weeks after taking over the reins of power, Thutmosa III rode out at the head of his army on his first military campaign to the Near East. He was determined, no doubt, to prove himself as brave and resolute a leader as his forebear, but there was also an immediate political imperative. While Hatshepsut's regime had been preoccupied with construction projects at home, Egypt's foreign rivals had not been idle. The kingdom of Mitanni, temporarily humbled by Thutmose I, had reasserted itself and was busy stirring up resistance to Egyptian rule among a coalition of Asiatic princes. Chief among them was the Prince of Kadesh, modern Tel Nebi Mend, who had holed himself up with his key allies in the fortified town of Megiddo, the biblical Armageddon. Since Megiddo controlled the Jezreel Valley, the main north-south route through northern Canaan as well as the easiest route between the Jordan Valley and the Mediterranean coast, Egypt ignored such unwelcome developments at its peril. Attack was the best form of defense. At the end of winter 1458, Thutmose III and his household division of 10,000 men passed through the border fortress of Charu, bound for Megiddo. After a march of nine days, they reached Gaza and bedded down for the night in friendly company. But this was no time for relaxation. They were off again at the crack of dawn, setting forth in valor, victory, power, and vindication. Eleven a further eleven days march through unfamiliar and hostile territory brought the army to the town of Yehem, where the king held a war council. From Yehem, three roads led to Megiddo, one to the north, one to the south, and the most direct route through the narrow Aruna Pass. According to the official campaign record, the king argued for the Aruna Road against the advice of his generals. Whatever the truth behind the decision, it was inspired, for as the Egyptian soldiers advanced through the narrow defile, with Thutmose leading from the front, they met no resistance. The enemy had been waiting for them to the north and south, never expecting them to risk the Aruna Road. Once the Egyptian rear guard had safely emerged from the pass, the entire force continued down the road toward Megiddo and pitched camp on the bank of the Kenna. Brook in the early afternoon. Like Shakespeare's Henry V on the eve of Agincourt, Thutmose steeled his men for battle the following morning, telling the soldiers of the watch, be steadfast, be steadfast. Be vigilant, be vigilant. At daybreak on April 27, the king appeared in the midst of his infantry, standing on a chariot of Electrum and clad in shining armor, a dazzling sight to inspire his troops and intimidate the enemy. It seems to have done the trick, for the opposing forces fled headlong toward Megiddo with faces of fear, abandoning their horses and their chariots of gold and silver, the men, to be hoisted up into the town by their close. Thirteen then, to the Egyptians' eternal shame, their discipline cracked, and instead of pressing home their advantage, they set about 
plundering the possessions the enemy had left behind on the battlefield. Having failed to capture Megiddo before the town could muster its defenses, the Egyptians found themselves preparing for a long siege. A detachment of soldiers was sent to measure the town walls, while others cut down the surrounding orchards. After a great effort, Megiddo was surrounded by the Egyptians with a wooden wall, seven feet high and three feet thick, and was further isolated by a ditch. As the days and weeks dragged on, some of the beleaguered and famished townspeople came out to surrender, and were duly pardoned. For the Prince of Kadesh and his allies, it was only a matter of time. Eventually, they too surrendered to Thutmosa, crawling upon their bellies to kiss the ground before His Majesty's might, and to beg breath for their nostrils. 14. Their public submission was only the beginning. The victorious king appointed new rulers to all their towns, seized their land, and annexed it to the royal treasury. The produce from the rich, arable fields of the Megiddo Plain, together with annual tribute from across the Near East, gave Egypt the economic clout to match its political and military might. The haul of booty from the Battle of Megiddo was stupendous. Two thousand horses and nearly a thousand chariots, almost two thousand cattle, the same number of goats, and more than twenty thousand sheep, 1,796 male and female slaves and their children, and numerous prisoners of war, including the wives of the ruler of Kadesh. All in all, it was the most significant military event of Thutmose III's reign. And it secured Egyptian control over the Transjordan for the next four centuries. The dread and envy of them all. Behind the official rhetoric of the campaign annals, the spoils of Megiddo also had a human dimension. Egyptian soldiers returned from battle with foreign wives as well as plunder. The captives and concubines who made the long journey to the Nile Valley brought about a transformation of Egyptian society, integrating themselves with their host communities and turning New Kingdom Egypt into a thoroughly cosmopolitan country, a wholly unintended consequence of Egypt's imperial adventures. The Nile Valley had always been a melting pot of peoples and cultures, Mediterranean and African influences coexisting and cross-pollinating. From prehistoric times Egypt had welcomed immigrants from other lands, as long as they thoroughly integrated themselves and adopted Egyptian customs. Even at the height of the Pyramid Age, when Egyptian chauvinism and self-confidence had known no bounds, a native citizen of Memphis might have rubbed shoulders with a shipwright from Kabni or a mercenary from Nubia albeit bearing adopted Egyptian names. But the influx of foreigners, prompted by Thutmose III's campaigns was on an altogether different scale. Egyptian towns and cities found themselves home to significant foreign populations, and the migrants were quick to make the most of their new opportunities. One particularly talented prisoner of war, named Pa Bale, rose to become chief architect in the Temple of Amun, an office his descendants held for at least six generations. Even the royal palace witnessed changing attitudes toward foreigners. Among the booty brought back from the Near East by Thutmose III were three Syrian women on whom the young king seems to have doted. One of them was named Manuai, from the Amorite word, meaning to love. Her companions were named Manyata and Maruta. Hebrew Martha, meaning lady. Thutmose showered all three of them with sumptuous gifts, golden armlets, bracelets, and anklets. Beaded collars, diadems inlaid with precious stones, vessels of precious metal, and rare glass vases. Barely a century after the expulsion of the hated Hyksos, the Egyptian king had Asiatic wives in his harem. It was a remarkable turnaround. After Megiddo, Thutmose III led another 16 military operations in the Near East during the next two decades, at a dizzying frequency of almost one a year. Most were little more than heavily militarized tours of inspection, to cement previous victories and receive tribute from vassal princes. But a few forays into Syria-Palestine had real military objectives. The city-state of Tunip, in northern Syria, posed a particular threat, and was the focus of three consecutive campaigns. Thutmose turned his forces against Tunip's coastal protectorates, conquering them, taking their rulers hostage and transforming their harbors into fortified supply centers for the Egyptian army. Slowly but surely, Egypt 
was eliminating the opposition and annexing large swaths of the Near East. Where Thutmose I had been content with a show of force, his grandson was determined to win and hold territory for the long term. Not that Thutmose III was immune to the attractions of a propaganda coup. For his eighth campaign, he decided to set the seal on his grandfather's achievements, following in his footsteps to the very borders of Mitanni. As it had two generations earlier, the Egyptian army journeyed by sea from the delta to Kubni. There, timber was cut and ships were built, which the pharaoh's men proceeded to haul over land to the banks of the Euphrates. Having crossed the great bend of Naharan in bravery and victory at the head of his army, 15 Thutmose found the Mitannian forces ill-prepared for battle. Their king fled, and his nobility sought refuge in nearby caves to escape the Egyptian onslaught that devastated the surrounding towns and villages. Thutmose took the enemy's retreat as a surrender, and recorded his triumph on a stella set up right next to Thutmose I's victory inscription. History was repeating itself, just as the king intended. To complete the coup de théâtre, the pharaoh proceeded to Nye, where he killed 120 elephants in direct emulation of his grandfather. He then took time out to visit the local bow-making industry at nearby Katna and participate in a sporting conquest, before collecting more tribute from the native princes and marching back to Egypt. Altogether, the campaign lasted a record five months. The plaudits from Mitanni's fellow enemies came thick and fast. Babylonia sent gifts of lapis lazuli, the Hittites sent shipments of silver, gems, and wood. Assyrian envoys brought tribute. Two, as, a little later, did delegations from Ashua, on the Ionian coast, and the land of Tanaya, perhaps Mycenae, which provided silver and rare iron. Egypt's reputation was at its zenith, and Thutmose. Three, Egypt's warrior pharaoh, was the toast and envy of foreign capitals. From the Aegean to the Persian Gulf, there remained only the unfinished business of Nubia. Or brute force had failed to crush Kushite opposition, perhaps a more calculated policy might succeed. Kerma had been rebuilt time and again by its loyal citizens, so rather than raising the city to the ground, Thutmose III took the simpler expedient of founding his own Egyptian settlement next door, drawn away by opportunities for trade and employment. The population of Kerma slowly but surely migrated the short distance to the new town of Pnubs. Starved of commerce, the old city, talisman of Kushite nationhood, withered and died. Instead of killing the local rulers and hanging them upside down from his bowsprit, Thutmose III brought them and their families back to Egypt for a spell of assimilation, before repatriating them, thoroughly acculturated, to continue administering their homelands on behalf of the Egyptian crown. While Egyptian control was never as strong in Kush as it was in Wawat, Thutmose's policy was a success, and serious rebellions did not trouble the new kingdom pharaohs again. Thutmose III was justly hailed in his lifetime as the ruler who makes his boundary as far as the horn of the earth, the marshes of Naharan. Sixteen in the eyes of posterity, he was, perhaps, the greatest of all. Pharaohs. Chapter 12. King and Country. All the King's Men. Thutmose III's foreign conquests loom large in contemporary accounts of his reign and still dominate our view 35 centuries later. Yet, while the king spent long periods away on campaign, especially during the first two decades of his sole rule, he could not afford to neglect domestic affairs. Egypt was geographically extensive, and a nation of strong local and regional traditions. The forces of decentralization were never far beneath the surface. Bitter experience, twice in Egypt's history, had shown that in the absence of firm central government, the country could easily fall prey to political fragmentation, internal conflict, and foreign invasion. For the early 18th dynasty kings, Amos and Amenhotep I, rebuilding their shattered realm had been the priority, overseas. Adventures an unaffordable distraction. That Thutmose III was able to devote his considerable reserves of energy to widening the frontiers of Egypt is a testament as much to his forebears' administrative reforms as to his own leadership skills. For the system of government that the early New Kingdom rulers put in place strengthened the absolute 
power of the monarch while releasing him from the day-to-day -day. exigencies of running the country. The king might be the sole source of power, simultaneously head of state and government, commander in chief of the armed forces, high priest of every cult and the gods, representative on earth, and the arbiter of policy, but in practice he delegated matters to a small handful of trusted officials, reveling in their status and wealth, these men, and they were all men, Egypt might have accommodated itself to a female pharaoh, but the corridors of power remained an all-male preserve, who ran the country during the new kingdom commission for themselves beautifully decorated sepulchres in the Theban hills. The so-called tombs of the nobles are a favorite tourist attraction today, but also a revealing window on the king's inner circle. Look beyond the brightly colored wall paintings, and the murky reality of power politics comes sharply into view. For practical purposes, the administration of Egypt was divided into separate departments. Central government combined the office of royal construction projects, headed by an overseer of works, with a all-important treasury, under the control of the chancellor. The army had its own overseer, as did the Nubian gold mines, so vital to the prosperity of the Egyptian economy. Provincial government was the responsibility of regional appointees, such as the king's son and overseer of the southern countries, who administered Egyptian-controlled Nubia, while individual towns had their own mayors. Thebes. The monarchy's theological power base, was treated as a special case, with its own devolved administration entrusted to ultra-loyalists. Each temple in the land had its own priesthood with economic as well as religious authority. First among equals was the high priest of Amun, who exercised effective control over the vast land holdings and other assets that belonged to the temple of Ipizit. Finally, there was the department responsible for the royal household and for the estate that supplied its material needs. Here, the royal steward held sway, controlling access to the king's person and enjoying privileged access to the monarch. At the very top of the government machine, filling the role of intermediary between every department and the king, was the office of vizier, effectively prime minister. In the 18th dynasty, this position was divided into two, with a northern vizier based in Memphis and a southern vizier in Thebes. All in all, it was a highly effective system, giving the king, through his placemen, control over every aspect of the nation's affairs. In the days of the pyramids, the major offices of state had been reserved for male members of the royal family, but such a system would have provided the king's younger brothers and sons with opportunities to build up rival power bases, and could have proved disastrous. In the late Fourth Dynasty, the upper ranks of the administration had been open to men of non-royal birth. Not only did this keep the king's potential rivals away from positions of influence, but it also enabled the government to be run in a more professional way. By the early New Kingdom, with Egypt engaged in international relations and empire building on an unprecedented scale, the king's male relatives, with the exception of the crown prince, could be safely packed off to join the army, much like the younger sons of British monarchs in more recent times. There, they could find an outlet for their skills, and frustration, in the service of the state. Meanwhile, back at home, an entire ruling class of bureaucratic families had established itself at the pinnacle of ancient Egyptian society. Its members monopolized the best jobs, often passing them down from one generation to another. Within this small and claustrophobic clique, men of talent and ambition jostled for power, currying favor with the king too advance their own careers. A quartet of high-ranking bureaucrats who served under Thutmose III and his successor illustrate particularly well the nature of authority in ancient Egypt and the atmosphere of sycophancy and suspicion that permeated the king's inner circle. Through them, we may glimpse the inner workings of the Egyptian state at the height of its power and prestige. Church and state. Menkhepera Seneb was high priest of Amun, in overall charge of the great Temple of Amun Ra at Ipizit, the most important religious foundation. In Egypt, the string of titles inscribed in Menkhepera Seneb's tomb emphasizes his status as occupant of the senior sacerdotal office in the country, superintendent of the priests of Upper and Lower Egypt, administrator of the two thrones of the god, superintendent of 
Advanced Offices, Superintendent of the Double Treasuries of Gold and Silver, Superintendent of the Temple of Teikau Amun, set over the Mysteries of the Two Goddesses. Typically for a senior member of the Ruling Elite, Menka Parasaneb's chief qualification for high office was His personal connection with the royal family. Menka Para was the Throne name of Thutmose III, and Menka Parasaneb's very name. Menka Para is healthy expressed his devotion to the monarch, a loyalty born of close family ties. Menka Parasaneb's grandmother had grown up in the royal palace as a foster sister of the young Thutmose I. While his mother had been a royal nurse, it is quite likely that Menka Parasaneb himself grew up on the fringes of the royal household, and these connections undoubtedly played a part in his rapid promotion through the ranks of the Theban priesthood. For the ordinary citizens of Thebes, the 18th dynasty ushered in a new era of public religious spectacle, far removed from the rarefied and secretive activities that had characterized state cults in earlier periods. The city at large had been transformed into a giant open-air arena for the celebration of divine kingship, and the gods themselves had been brought out from behind the high walls of temples to spread their beneficence among the populace. In the privacy of their humble homes the peasant farmers of Upper Egypt continued to worship their traditional household deities, Tower at the Hippopotamus, protector of pregnant women, Bess the lion-faced dwarf, guardian of mothers and children, and the cow goddess, Hathor, who watched over all her devotees with a maternal eye. But these familiar companions were now joined by altogether more exalted members of the state pantheon, notably the moon god Khonsu, his mother, Mut, and her consort Amun Ra, king of the gods. During the great processions that were a feature of Theban religion in the new kingdom, this triad of deities became directly accessible to the common people for the first time. On high days and holidays, in particular the beautiful festival of the valley and the annual festival of Opet, the bark shrines of Amun, Mut, and Khonsu were borne on the shoulders of priests from the great temple of Ipizza through the crowded Theban streets. Farmers and blacksmiths, as much as scribes and priests, could bask in the warm glow of the divine presence as it passed by. Not only did these spectacles bring color and gaiety to humdrum lives, but the rites also allowed the citizenry to feel more closely allied with the official dogma of the state. As always, Pharaonic religion was as much about politics as about piety. From its headquarters at Ipizit, the cult of Amun dominated Theban society on every level. To judge from the scenes and texts in his tomb, Menka Parasaneb's secular duties as high priest were more important than his sacred role. He took a keen interest in Thutmose III's building projects at Ipizit, and boasted of having directed the work on his monuments. More important still was the administration of the temple's economic assets, its extensive herds of cattle, its land holdings throughout Egypt, and its mining interests in the eastern desert and Nubia. Menka Parasaneb spent much of his time inspecting livestock, supervising the delivery of agricultural and mineral revenues, and ensuring that the temple granaries were kept restocked, all, of course, on behalf of the sovereign. Part of the wealth that poured into Ipizza was destined for the temple workshops, which employed the finest craftsmen in the land. Their job was to manufacture costly objects not only for the temple itself, but also for the royal household, temple and palace. In ancient Egypt the two institutions were inextricably intertwined and mutually reinforcing. As high priest, Menka Parasaneb's primary duty was to bolster the monarchy, ideologically and financially. These twin strands came together most spectacularly in the formal presentation of foreign envoys to the king. The parade of colorful foreign emissaries with their exotic goods. Minoans with animal-headed drinking cups, Syrians with tame bears. Hittites and Asiatics with weaponry and metal ingots, served to emphasize the superiority of the Egyptian ruler over all other lands, and also his fabulous material wealth. While Menka Parasaneb ensured that the Temple of Amun Ra and its priesthood remained loyal to the monarch, his colleague Rikamira was tasked with an even greater responsibility, the smooth running of the civilian administration throughout Upper Egypt. As Southern Vizier, 
Rika Meyer exercised a combination of courtly, judicial, and administrative authority, hearing petitioners with a grievance against the authorities, presiding as chief judge in important cases, and receiving daily briefings from other government ministers. In his own words, he was second, only, to the king. One Rika Myra, two, owed his exalted position more to influence than to innate ability, coming from a long line of viziers. In accordance with the Egyptian concept of Mat, truth, justice, and righteousness, the vizier was sworn to carry out his duties with impartiality. At Rika Myra's installation, the king himself delivered the admonishment with these words. For his part, Rika Myra claimed to have observed this injunction scrupulously. Yet there is something rather telling about his protestations. They suggest that the reverse was the norm, and that most ordinary Egyptians received rough justice from those in authority. The balance of Rika Myra's activities is also revealing. Aside from his tours of inspection and his daily audience when he listened to plaintiffs in the hall of the vizier, flanked by the master of the privy chamber on his right and the receiver of income on his left, his schedule was dominated by briefings from subordinates. Alongside reports from the treasury and the royal estate, key intelligence was provided each day by the head of the palace guard, the garrison commanders, and the head of the security service. The king's personal safety seems to have weighed as heavily as the national economy. Underlining the autocratic nature of the ancient Egyptian regime. As well as Prime Minister and First Lord of the Treasury, the Vizier was effectively Commissioner of Police, Minister for the Armed Forces, and Interior Minister as well. Rika Meyer also paid regular visits to Ipizit, no doubt to ensure that the High Priest was performing up to the mark, further evidence of the close connection between religious and secular spheres. Having received information from every Department of State, Rika Meyer relayed this to the king at a daily conference. While the vizier might coordinate government policy, there was no doubt where ultimate authority lay and where the power to hire and fire senior officials rested. Despite impeccable connections, Rika Meyer's family did not succeed in holding on to high office for a further generation. When Thutmose III was succeeded by Amenhotep II, 1426-1400, the old vizier's sons, who might have expected to follow in their father's eminent footsteps, were passed over in favor of another family altogether. A new broom, a deliberate break with the past, brought about a decisive change of family at the top of the upper Egyptian bureaucracy, and reminded the ruling elite of the precariousness of power in an absolute monarchy. The king giveth and the king taketh away, blessed be the name of the king. Pride and prejudice. The chief beneficiary of the new reign was a family with equally strong royal connections to Amenhotep II, not his predecessor. As a young prince, Amenhotep II had received instruction from a man named Amos Hume, who was also overseer of the harem palace, the institution that provided a home for the king's wives and children. Amos Humeistuo's sons grew up, if not side by side with the prince, then certainly in the same milieu. When Amenhotep came to the throne, he lost no time in promoting his childhood companions to high office. The elder brother, Amenemopet, gained the southern vizirate in succession too. Rikamira, while the younger brother, Senefer, literally good brother, was appointed mayor of Thebes. Between them, Amenemopet and Senefer controlled virtually every aspect of the upper Egyptian administration. Moreover, both brothers reinforced their membership in the new king's inner circle by marrying women. From the same background, Amenemopet married a woman of the harem palace, and Senefer a royal wet nurse. Senefer is one of the few new kingdom officials whose true character can be seen in the official record, through the carefully chosen biographical details inscribed in his tomb. Although granted the extremely rare privilege, along with his brother, of a burial in the Valley of the Kings, it is his second Theban sepulchre that is the more famous. Dubbed the Tomb of the Vines, it is remarkable for its ceiling, which is molded and painted to resemble a fruitful vine, laden with pendant bunches of grapes. It conjures up an image of Senefer the Bon Vivant, the mayor who spends his lifetime in happiness. 3. This is reinforced by a painting in the tomb and a beautifully carved statue of 
Senefer and his wife, both of which share the same small detail, a pendant in the shape of two conjoined hearts, worn by Senefer. Around his neck. The pendant is inscribed with the throne name of Amenhotep II and must have been a royal gift. It was evidently Senefer's most treasured possession, talisman and symbol of his king's favor. Not for nothing did Senefer describe himself as one who satisfies the heart of the king. For the pun may have been Intentional. Senefer's statue is signed by the two sculptors who fashioned it, which is unusual. Amenmzinched Konzu were outlined draftsmen of the Temple of Amun. Senefer seems to have used his contacts at Ipizza to procure the services of skilled craftsmen for his own personal project. Such arrangements must have happened all the time, and reflect the private face of public office. Another piece of evidence that reveals Senefer's character is an even more remarkable survival, a sealed and unopened letter. Addressed by him to a man named Baki, who was a tenant farmer in the town of Hut Sekum, modern Hu, north of Thebes. The reason for the missive was to give notice of Senefer's impending arrival at Hutscombe, where he intended to take delivery of certain supplies. In imperious tones, Senefer hectors his subordinate, warning him. While Baki may have deserved such a dressing down, it is equally Likely that this was the way Senefer, proud mayor of Thebes, addressed all his underlings. Pomp and circumstance one hand in. Hand with pride and arrogance, the story of officialdom throughout. History. No member of the 18th dynasty administration demonstrates. This self-satisfied conceit more unashamedly than the fourth member of. Our high-ranking quartet, Amenhotep II's chief steward, Kenemun. Like. Senefer and Amenemopet. Kenemun grew up in the harem palace. Where his mother was wet nurse to the future king. He referred to her. Unblushingly, as the great nurse who brought up the god. Six Kenemun. Was effectively the prince's foster brother, and the bond forged. Between the two boys in childhood endured, paying dividends for. Kenemun when his playmate acceded to the throne. Kenemun's early career in the army included a spell of active. Service fighting alongside the king on his Syrian campaign. Not only were the ties of friendship strengthened on the battlefield, but Kenemun's loyalty and physical fitness would also, doubtless, have struck Amenhotep II as eminently suitable qualities for preferment. Back from the wars, the king appointed Kenemun to the stewardship of Perunfer, a harbor and naval base in northern Egypt. Further, promotion followed swiftly, Kenemun's devoted service eventually landing him one of the plum jobs in the land, that of chief steward with overall responsibility for the royal estate. It was an important position. Supervising the land holdings and other assets that funded the court. On a day-to-day -day basis, Kenemun had specific responsibility for the royal family's country residence. This seems to have fitted his character perfectly, since the administrative drudgery was more than usually interspersed with lavish entertainments, troops of dancing girls, musicians, and the presentation of exotic gifts to the king at the new year.